Hey y'all, it's Ashley Bookish Realm. Welcome back to another video, or welcome if you're new here. I swear I feel like I rotate the same shirts in and out all the time. I don't have a limited wardrobe, I just don't know why I feel more comfortable wearing certain shirts on camera and others not. I guess it's just me. Kind of kind of strange. I'm I'm a strange human. Hey y'all, welcome back to a, another video here on the channel. As you can see, we are here to talk about all of the 38 books that I ended up reading in October. Not really talking about all of them, what I mean is I am here to highlight the best and the most disappointing books of the month. As you know, or if you didn't know, it's something that I do. I do these recent reads once a week and then I highlight my top and bottom books of the month because I read a lot and it's just a lot to review everything at once and by doing things kind of like vlog style it makes it easier because I can edit the clips as I go anyway I'm sure you get the point but before we get started with today's video I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a book of the month so if you didn't know book of the month is super popular fast-growing online book service which I'm sure that you all have heard about the amazing things that book of the month does but if you're new to this game and you didn't know their mission is to promote new and emerging authors so that readers can end up finding something new that maybe they wouldn't have experienced before. So each month, the way the process works, each month, Book of the Month vets through hundreds, I mean hundreds of books, and they choose a specially curated list of books for you to choose from. These titles include newly and early release. So when I say early release, that means that sometimes we have access to books before they actually hit the shelves in the general market. And this helps you spend more time reading and less time researching. If you're anything like me, my God, y'all, time is a funny thing and we don't have enough of it. I am convinced that there's not really 24 hours in a day because I need all the time that I can get to read. So it's nice that Book of the Month comes up with a list for you to choose from. That way you don't have to focus so hard on trying to pick out books for yourself. One of the cool things that I really, really enjoy about Book of the Month is that they have a wide variety of genres to choose from. I'm somebody that reads kind of like all over the place, whether that be historical fiction, romance, contemporary fiction, realistic fiction, sci-fi, fantasy. I kind of read it all. So it's nice that Book of the month offers the opportunity not only in diversity of their authors that they're choosing but also in the diversity of the genres that they are providing for people to choose from. Book of the month is also risk-free. They have this amazing skip policy so if there's ever a month where you do not want to pick from the books that they have curated you can skip that month and you won't be charged for it. One of the other most amazing things about this too is that for today if you use my code bookish realm you can get your first book for $9.99. Also if you didn't know Book of the month is that now it's shipping to Canada so if you are a viewer of mine and you live in Canada book of the month is now accessible to you so definitely take advantage of all these great resources that they are providing so I'm going to talk a little bit about the selections that are available for the month of November so every month your book of the month book is going to come in this blue book of the month box which is a hallmark of the company the five choices that are available for this month include the last party we Are the Light, White Horse, The Wilder Women, and Someday Maybe. There are also two add-ons that you can choose from which include Blood Marked and Before I Let Go. So for this month, naturally, I ended up choosing Blood Mark as my book of the month a pick. This is, oh, I'm so excited to pick this. I actually picked Blood Mark and Before I Let it Go. I am super excited and anticipating Blood Mark by Tracy Dion. This is the follow-up to the book Legend. Born. If you didn't know, Legend Born is an Arthurian retelling that it came out about a year ago, or maybe it was a little more than a year ago, and I really, really, really ended up enjoying that book. I just think it had so many great things to offer in terms of character development and world building, and so I have been highly anticipating this follow-up, Bloodmark, which is a chunker, y'all. I did not realize that this one was over 500 pages, but definitely looking forward to reading this. I can't really tell you much about this one, simply because of the fact is a sequel and because I don't want to spoil anything from the first book. So the next thing that I ended up choosing was Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan and this one is interesting for me because it's not it's not technically like a marriage in crisis which is one of my favorite tropes in romance because our two main characters do not end up being able to work things 
comes out, it doesn't save their marriage, but it's more like a second chance romance. But I'm happy that it is research recircling back to a couple that was previously married. That makes it really, really interesting. It focuses on these two main characters who were doing well. They had their ups and downs, and then they went through a space and time in their relationship where they couldn't save their marriage. So then they end up co-parenting and they found a new rhythm. Everything is working out for them. But then they realize that there's something that keeps drawing them back together. And so they try to make this whole situation work. I'm excited to see where we go from that point of them trying to rework everything, what things they're going to have to address. Definitely one that I can't wait to get my hands on. As I said before, y'all, if you're interested in checking out a book of the month, make sure you use my code bookishrum and I'll leave the link to the website down in the description box below. As always, thank you so much to book of the month for sponsoring this video. Okay, y'all. So this was an interesting reading month. I read a lot in the month of October. October was also Black Aweenathon. So there was that. I ended up diving more so into my comics and graphic novels because as you know, naturally I have a second channel, which I will put up in the card symbol above. So I've been doing a lot over there in terms of content. So we're just going to go ahead and jump into the statistics. Remember that I'm not going to review every book that I read. I am going to give you my tops and my bottoms of the month, but I do like to provide you with a little bit of statistics beforehand. So this month I ended up reading 38 books for a page count of 8,374 pages, which is still a little bit below my 10,000 mark that I like to reach for the month. Hopefully in this month and December, I kind of push it as hard as I can in order to reach that 100,000 page goal. I actually need to start going back through and reviewing everything that I haven't reviewed yet because it will help me get a better picture of where I'm at in December. So my goal is to catch up on all my reviews during this month. In terms of format that I read at 19 were physical, which is also not surprising because when I have a tendency to lean more into my graphic novels, comics, and manga, I am typically reading a little bit more on the physical side as opposed to on the digital end because I've been trying to read a lot of what's already on my shelf. So that's why we have a 19 there. We have six digital, which includes the fact that I did end up reading some of my graphic novels and comics through Hoopla, which is why we have six digital, which is a little bit lower. I'm surprised that we got even split between physical and digital and audio, which is good, but I usually like it even split between all three. And then I have a 13 that I listen to via audio, which is no surprise because that's just how it usually works with me. I also am looking at some diversity here. 24 of the books that I read were by BIPOC authors and included BIPOC characters. So I'm just going to go ahead. I have my notebook here for a good intention because I had to write everything down. I'm going to go ahead and tell you exactly what I read throughout the month and then we'll get into the worst books first and then the best books last because I always like to end these videos on a positive note. Okay, so the first book that I read was The Keeper, Ice Cream Man, Volume 1, Chew, Volume 1, A Silent Voice, Volume 1, Amari and the Night Brothers, If I Could Reach You, Volume 3, The Davenport, Food Wars, Volume 16, Food Wars, Volume 17, and Food Wars, Volume 18, A Silent Voice, Volume 2, Little House in the Big Woods, Smile, Real Account, Volume 1, The Lost Library, House of Hunger, They Never Tell, Nana, Fear, The Fun House, Issue Number 1, I'm Glad My Mom Died, If I Could Reach You, Volume 4, Alice in Borderland, Chainsaw Man, Volume 1, Lovesick, Issue Number 1, Punchline, the Gotham Game Issue 1, Namor the Submariner Issue Number 1, Sex Cult Nun, The Mean Girl Who Never Speaks, Do You Take This Man, The Vicious Vet, The Inheritance Games, Wakanda Issue Number 1, Omega Morales, and the Legend of the La La Chusa. Well, that was unexpected. The Door of No Return, Milk in My Coffee, Hoodoo, and Into the Wild. So let's go ahead and jump into my most disappointing books of the month. And so we're going to start off with a book that does not release until January of next year, which as I've been down here to grab it off of the floor, it was a huge disappointment for me, y'all. Goodness gracious. Here we go. It was a huge disappointment for me and that's the Davenports by Crystal Marquis. I feel like I've talked about this book pretty extensively that I think everyone pretty much knows my thoughts on it. This is a historical romance more so than a historical fiction. I thought that maybe 
this book was going to focus more on the historical fiction aspects of it but unfortunately it led more to the historical romance aspects which is fine if that's what you're looking for when you're going into it but this is not what I was looking for when I was going into it because this is a little known piece of history that has not been explored to my knowledge in YA and so I was hoping that we would get a little bit more of that little lost piece of history as opposed to focusing on the relationships of our four main characters so this book focuses on four main characters the four main characters are Olivia, Ruby, Helen, and Amy Rose. Olivia and Helen are sisters. Amy Rose is a friend of the family, but also the family servant. And then Ruby is the best friend of Olivia. So we follow through the book, all four of them in alternating perspectives, learning about their lives as they fit into society. So basically what you're seeing is Olivia and Helen are part of this elite black community. Their family is the Davenports. They are used to having wealth. And what's so interesting about this book, or what I found so interesting about the premise of this book is that it is told from the perspective of black wealth at the turn of the 20th century. And with their close friend or more so Olivia's close friend, Amy Rose, what we are getting or sorry with Ruby not Amy Rose but we're getting from Ruby's perspective is also kind of this elite wealth in the black community at the turn of the 20th century except that we're looking more so at what it's like to try to maintain that status and wealth in a community when you really don't have that money anymore so we kind of get that perspective with her but it's super unfortunate because what I thought was going to be kind of these views and perspectives of like class and wealth and race, especially when it comes to Olivia. We get a little bit in Olivia's perspective of being a privileged black person and not really realizing what her other black community members were going with, especially because Jim Crow was starting to heighten up during this time and people were protesting and trying to advocate for better civil rights for black people. So if you didn't know civil rights does exist outside of the 60s <laughs> just in case you're wondering because some people didn't realize that but it's just super unfortunate that we only get a slight glimpse of that and the book so heavily focuses in on the romantic aspects yes i know it does describe romance happening in the description of this book however i did not think that it was going to be so saturated with the romance to the point that i felt like we lose the essence of the historical parts of it and that this book technically could have taken place in any <laughs> any decade and just include Included wealthy you know rich black people that was the hugest hiccup for me and I couldn't understand why so many people just kept comparing it to whatever that book is the Bridgertons I couldn't understand for the life of me why people kept comparing this to the Bridgertons and that it was like black Bridgertons and I still would never ever give the Bridgertons that clout I'm sorry I'm just not gonna do it but I see why people were looking at this more so as a historical romance that centered black characters as opposed to it being a historical fiction with romantic elements that really focus on the class race societal issues that were impacting black people we only get a sliver of that and me the history nerd that I I am was expecting so much more and I didn't get it so this ended up being a disappointing read for me I still ended up giving it three stars it definitely ends in a way that leads for a, kind of like an open gateway for like a second book like this could definitely be a duology or a series I don't know how many books they kind of have up their sleeves but unfortunately for me it just was not my favorite and I was hoping for so much more than what I ended up getting from this and yeah so there's that the next one that i have on this list is one that people should not be surprised about because i have talked about this one several times as well and that's the inheritance games i do not have any intention on finishing this series i thought that this book was incredibly boring the premise of it sounds really interesting where we have a main character who has the ability or has just found out that she is inheriting this money from a guy that she's never met she knows nothing about this family but she's basically getting all of this money but there are some mentors or I say psychological games kind of tied into this inheritance and how she interacts with these family members I thought that the premise of that would be really really interesting especially when we're talking about like psychological games you're playing mind games with these kids in order for them to get this inheritance and I'm thinking like they have so many codes that they have to crack so many interesting things that could be developed within the framework of this book and unfortunately it did not deliver I did not find it exciting I did not find it fun I did not find it interesting I found it extremely 
boring and it was full of nothing but teenage angst. I know that I am not the target audience for this book and I'm not upset about the teenage angst that's in the book. However, I feel like if you're writing a summary or you're writing a blurb for what this book is going to be about and you don't deliver, then I come in full fledged with criticism. And so I am coming in a full fledged with criticism of this one because I feel like for the premise that was written or the blurb that was given for this book, it did not deliver at all. We focus more so on this love triangle, the possibility of romance and relationships existing as opposed to the games. If your book is titled The Inheritance Games, sis, you have got to deliver these games. There was no games. And so there was like a game sprinkled here and there. And I, I simply came for the games. And so since that was not there, I found the book to be really, really dry and really, really boring. And another thing about it that just kind of drove me wild was that I was listening to the audiobook and I was sitting at my desk listening to this. And I was like, when is this book going to be over? This book is so slow. It is so dry. Nothing of relevance is even happening. I'm so tired of hearing about, oh, well, this person may like me or we may have this relationship or we may have this dynamic. I have not in a very, very long time sat and listened to the audiobook and like, when is this going to be over? I technically should have DNF this one, but by nature, I'm a completist. So I kept with it. This was a two star read for me. I did not enjoy it. I don't understand what the hype is for this one, but I won't be continuing the series. And it definitely was probably my number one most disappointing read of the month. The next one that I have is a mean girl who, who never speaks. Yes. The mean girl who never speaks. This was a disappointing read for a couple of reasons. So this was one that started off, a lot of my viewers y'all know that this is the poop book where we have a main character who is a detective, this is Detective Dove. She is obsessed with poop. And so I definitely get why this is a book that is catered to a younger audience. Kids love talking about poop if you didn't, like it's just a thing. And so I found it hilarious when I was beginning to read it. I thought elements of it really, really work for a children's audience, but one thing that I did not like that dropped it down for me, which only made it a three star read and kind of made it disappointing is that we have a character that is clearly dealing with social anxiety. And what I did not like is that our main character is speaking on behalf of this character and speaking for this character. Whenever we have any type of disability representation, I think it is, it is definitely important that we're getting the perspective from the character that has this disability, not from a secondhand perspective, not someone speaking on behalf of or speaking for. I did not like that. I did see in the in probably maybe about 20% in that we were probably dealing with a character that did have social anxiety. And I'm glad that it was something that was discussed. I just don't like the way that it was discussed, meaning that I don't think that Detective Dove should have been the one to talk about the social anxiety and inform everyone of the social anxiety and kind of educate everyone because you're speaking for a group that is capable of speaking for themselves and I just didn't like that it just didn't sit well with me in terms of the final threads that came into the disability representation I don't really do well with any book where the community that is being represented is not allowed to speak for themselves and you have someone who doesn't necessarily fit into whatever marginalization they may be in it's speaking on their behalf. I just didn't like the way that that was worked out. So I ended up giving that one three stars, but I, there's also some questionable titles in this one in the series. So I highly doubt I'm going to continue with the series, but I thought it would be a fun one to kind of throw into the mix for Black Alinathon. And the last one that I have on my most disappointing books or my worst books of October is Do You Take This Man by Denise Williams. This is my third Denise Williams book. And this was extremely disappointing for me because of the fact that I typically enjoy Denise Williams. I enjoyed her first two books. This one was extremely boring. It is a heroine that is a a divorce attorney and she also officiates weddings which I thought in some ways would be a conflict of interest but I don't have enough knowledge to know how exactly that's going to like if it, it truly is a conflict of interest whatever and then we also have a hero who works for a wedding planning company which I did like that element because it kind of breaks away from those gender stereotypes of who can do wedding planning and who can't do wedding planning and our perceptions of who works for wedding planning companies. I thought that was really interesting. So the two of them don't like each other when they first meet, they meet at a wedding. They're not, they don't care for each other at all. It's a lot of banter going on. The issue that I had is that both characters were extremely dry and boring and I was not invested in the romance whatsoever. I think that it was nice that we did have some like 
open door scenes in terms of their relationships with each other but what i did not like is that i just felt no commitment to their relationship and i feel like it was because our heroine had issues with really enjoying or setting some type of commitment to the hero. I usually struggle greatly with any type of romance where I'm not interested or I'm not invested in the relationship between the characters because that's the whole point of a romance. It's to get invested in their relationship and I just was not invested in a relationship. I could care less whether they ended up together. I thought their scenes together were hot but as far as them being in a relationship I could care less and so it just it kind of fell flat for me which is disappointing because like i said i typically enjoy denise williams books but this one was not one that i found to be that interesting so let's go ahead and jump into the best books of this month we're going to start with omega morales this one was amazing y'all five star read for me it is a middle grade book that focuses on a character by the name of omega morales whose family has a lot of magical abilities and so her her best friend also is a ghost she's very very close with her cousin so let's just talk about the relationship dynamic between the characters is amazing Amazing. I love that Omega has a very supportive family. It's not often sometimes in middle grade and sometimes in YA too, there's this trope of like family not necessarily being all put together. There's some broken elements and there was none of that whatsoever. It definitely was one that specifically focused on the strength of a family and the support of a family. And I really, really love that. I love that that was a primary focus of this book or it was one of the primary focuses of this book. So we have strong family elements, we have strong friendships, but there is something weird that's going around in the community where there are some I'm trying not to spoil it. There's some animal related things that are going on. And so they're trying to figure out whether this is based off of this kind of it's it's not necessarily a myth, but it's a legend, <laughs> of course, because legend is in the title. And, uh, and of course, I wouldn't remember the rest of the title because I always feel like I'm going to butcher it. It's Omega Morales and the Legend of La Lechuza. So they're thinking that it's related to the Legend of La Lechuza. And they go through and they try to figure out who this individual, individual is and if they're responsible for all the weird things that have been happening in the community. When you find out exactly who this person is and their actual story, you realize there are so many interesting and like in-depth oh gosh analysis of what it means to like love and what it means to lose and what it means to fall into despair and how grief can quickly turn into hate and what people will do in times of grief and how they're not really that far removed from each other they can be two sides of the same coin and that is probably the part of it that just blew my mind away because i just think about how kids have to learn about grieving and love and hate and a lot of it comes from adults that are present within their life and I think that this was just such a great book that showed it in a very interesting and unique way and it explained why you had a character who went completely left and why they were doing the things that they were doing because they were grieving and that grief just ate at them until the point that it turned into hatred and then that hatred led to all of this other things and really it was because of how much they had loved and so it's just how all of these things are interconnected and showing the juxtaposition between all of these different elements these emotional elements it was just very very well done so if you have not read omega morales yet i you're definitely missing out and this is one that i highly highly recommend the next one that i have on this list is also one that i ended up giving five stars to and that's the door of no return by kwame alexander i reviewed this one in my recent reads number 12 where i ended up just falling apart and reviewing it and talking about it because it focuses on a young boy who is living in what would be the um achanti kingdom and there is is this kind of wrestling challenge that his brother ends up getting called into and then something completely goes left and things just just go downhill from there essentially like I can't even really explain all the details I can't really explain all the details without spoiling some aspects of it but it is a insight to slave trade child slavery and what a lot of kids ended up going through I don't easily say like I like books like this because it's not about liking the book it's about appreciating that these books exist especially for a younger audience because sometimes when we talk about slavery especially in schools I think in our mind we are heavily focused on like the adult aspect of it and not really the kids and that's not all the time but I think that sometimes when people think about that in their minds the vision that they get is of, of adults and not necessarily kids 
not realizing that there are kids who suffered at the hands of the slave trade, chattel slavery, and I always appreciate when books like this are created because the audience that is reading these books or the audience that these books are targeted for are primarily the same age as our main characters. And so they're getting to learn a perspective of something that someone went through that is the same age as them. And I always think that stuff like that is vital to kids' development into their learning experience. One of the other books that I've read that does that very well is Refugee by Alan Gratz. And so they're nothing in terms of like, if they're the same book, they're definitely not the same book at all. But in terms of providing a perspective for our readers that is some, that is coming from a place where the main character is the same age, I think they do the same thing with that. And so I did really, really appreciate that. The next one that I'm going to include on this is Nana by Brandon Massey. This is one that Brie talks about all the time, Brie from the Lot Petition. This is one that Brie talks about all the time. A lot of people were reading it during Black Weenathon. I found a copy through, what is the, any play? I know it was also available through Hoopla, but it was on any play. So I decided to listen to it via any play. And I really ended up enjoying it. I know that there are reviewers who have issues with how much we know as readers as opposed to how much the characters know but I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit anyway Nana is a book that focuses on a main character who's just lost her grandmother and she's never met her biological mother and when her grandmother passes away she ends up getting the opportunity to meet her biological mother at the funeral it's obvious for us as readers that there's something wrong with this woman that there's something off that her intentions are not really as pure as she's attempting to to make them and so what's funny about it is that that's where I think like a lot of reviewers have issue is that it's very it's painfully obvious that <laughs> It's painfully obvious that there's something wrong with this this woman but our main characters are slower at picking it up it's it's very fascinating but I looked at it through a different lens we have a main character who is essentially grieving the loss of the only mother that she's ever known and so when the opportunity comes for her to actually meet her biological mother and have another mother figure in her life she's gonna jump on that opportunity which means that a lot of what she does is not gonna make sense because she's blinded by grief she's blinded by that need to be wanted by a mother figure that absence of a mother figure is really something that haunting her and so things that are painfully obvious to us as readers things that we basically should recognize and and that we think she should recognize and realize is that is something that she can't really grapple with and this also explains why her husband starts to notice things faster than she can I think it does a lot of great things too when we talk about what it means to be desired and wanted at an older age and it really brings out the ageist behavior that a lot of us have ingrained in us because grandma does some things that are going to make you think like oh my gosh like how could she be doing these things when she's at her age and you can also see that in characters but I think what Brandon Massey does a great job of is illustrating the fact that why do we feel like as we get older we don't have the right to be wanted and to be desired and that we don't want to be beautiful that we don't don't want those things that we wanted when we were 20 30 years old and so when he does that like I'm like oh my gosh it really it really captures some ages things that I would think in my own mind when it comes to desirability of older people and things that we may find disgusting or gross or you shouldn't be doing that that's nasty and it's like but why is it disgusting why is it gross why is it nasty it really isn't that's that's us defining what age desirability should begin and when it should stop and that's not fair overall i thought it was a very very interesting book i enjoyed it i'm very excited to check out more brandon massey's books and it definitely was one of my favorites of the month um and i thank you brie for putting us all on because <laughs> really did enjoy it I thought it was a wild book I, I thought it was well written and well developed I really liked it so I ended up giving that one four stars and the last one that I have on my list is Into the Wild by Aaron Hunter which is a shocker of the year I talked about this one a little bit in my recent reads 13 video this was a big surprise for me I was not expecting to like this one as much as I ended up liking it which came as a complete shock for me I I listen I had heard so much about the 
the what's it called I can't even remember the book is called in into warrior cats so it's like the first book is called into a while I can't remember the name of the series I was not expecting to like the warrior cats as much as I did I didn't know what I was getting into the only thing I knew is that a lot of kids ended up reading these books they loved them they would fly off the shelf they never stay on the shelf I they're still coming out there's a whole bunch of spinoffs to these series and kids eat them up kids love them they can't get enough of them and I for the life of me was like I could not understand why because a lot of of people especially adults do not like when books are written from the perspective of animals it's kind of hard to grasp that but see I realized that I didn't really have a problem with it because I enjoy Tutti Sutherland's book The Wings of Fire which is told from the perspective of dragons and humans are not really involved it's just kind of the same thing with the warrior cat series where there are no humans involved and we're kind of talked about in a weird way like we're just the two legs so the book itself this first book focuses on a house cat made by the name of Rusty who's outside and he's quote-unquote hunting but he doesn't realize he's hunting in someone else's territory because he's a wildcat and he's a house cat and when they realize his tactical skills and his maybe possible like fighting ability they decide to take him under their wing and train him to become a warrior cat where he becomes a fire and I think he ends up being fire strike y'all please don't listen the names it's the one this the one thing that I did about the series it's gonna be difficult for me the names in this are kind of hard to keep up with because there's so many different clans first of all of cats there's a lot a whole lot of clans of cats and the, the primary clan that we're dealing with in this first book is the thunder clan but then there's a mention of the wind clan and some other clans it's just a lot to keep up with which is why I transitioned from reading these through audio and then reading them physically because I was like I'm not gonna be able to keep up with these names like this is just too much it's just way 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 too much for me to keep up with so I like I said I decided to switch up but it's a lot to keep up with but it's so fast paced and so interesting like it is definitely it's it's very much so cat like behavior which it's it's weird because I'm like oh this is like the, the whole territorial thing and we're doing this because we need to survive we need to eat and these clans have alliances with these clans and like the whole territory thing is very indicative of cats from what I do know about cats but I love this element of clans you know working together or they're waging war with each other and then there's like the star clan which is all of the cats that have passed on and it's just a very fascinating series and also a little bit on the violent side which I was not anticipating it is like people legitimately cats cats not people cats legitimately do get hurt and they do end up some of them do end up dying and I was very shocked by that kind of how I was kind of shocked with like the level of violence and wings of fire but I definitely see this for a middle grade audience it's like into fantasy that will end up reading fantasy like when they get into their teenage years and they become adults this is just like a great primer series for stuff like that there's a lot of betrayal that goes on this in <laughs> internal betrayal and external betrayal and I love that we get to see kind of Rusty develop into being a part of this world because he's primarily been a house cat and so he's being as he's learning and being exposed to this world and learning how to build alliances and how not to trust people and kind of had like kind of working the the area that he's in we too as readers are watching stuff like that unfold so I really really appreciate that I cannot wait to continue on with the rest of the series I'm hoping to read a great portion of the series and then maybe one day do like a whole video where I kind of do like like, you know, the pieces and parts of like, this is how you read it. These are my favorite characters, to your ranking favorite books or whatever. But it is a long series and I do want to read the spinoffs and that's like 30 something books, 30, 30 plus, but it's got to be 30 plus books because there's a manga, there's short stories slash novellas. It's a lot. It's a whole lot. And books like one of the books just came out this month. A new book just came out this book, um, this month. So yeah. But anyway, y'all, that's it. Those are my tops and my bottoms of the month. Please let me know in the comments below what were some of your favorite books and and your most disappointing books for the month of October. As always, if you're interested in following me on social media or you're interested in supporting the channel, all the links will be down in the description box below. If you want to never miss a video, make sure you click the subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications, and I will be back with a, another video soon.